Good morning, everyone. This is Jim Chastain. This is our Tuesday morning refresher session. I'm with the support group at Easy Power. The topic today we're calling infinite source not as bad as it sounds. The point being is that there's, a, I guess, a, a built-in assumption if we use the standard icon that's used in the Easy Power tools, there's certain uh, features that we would expect. And so let's jump into it. We're going to talk a little bit about infinite power source in Easy Power. And then as we kind of expand upon that and what it takes to model a utility source, talk in terms of what kind and how to get information, the right kind of information from the utility companies, what to do about it if you can't get the information you need, and then talk about some of the trade-offs involved with making certain assumptions. Those, and so there's going to be a lot of data, and as I get to the end of the presentation, although I, I'm not going to send out the slides, I will make available the links where you can download the source material that this information comes from. So uh, by all means, uh, you're welcome to ask questions along the way. And by the time we get to the end, I think there'll be, you'll really have available the information resources from where all this, this stuff comes from. Okay, so those of you that either watch a demo of the Easy Power Tools or build your own one-line diagrams using the tools will recognize this icon, which is what is uh, put on the one-line diagram or the drawing surface when we utilize the icon from the device library. So let me jump into the tools and let's talk about this. And along the way, I want to share a couple techniques for for modeling and for drawing systems, uh, one of which is, is utilizing the deactivate button very frequently when you're drawing your first one line, there's a temptation to draw everything, the whole one line radial distribution system or ring, whatever you have, and then try to go in one fell swoop into short circuit focus. The point may, being that you you may have a lot of errors, population errors, as far as the data that's required. And rather than get to that point before you realize you're not capturing all the data you need during the data collection phase, what I suggest is draw a, a single one line that includes the load you ultimately want to label, and then the path all the way back through the switching tree to the utility, and then with the rest of the system, whether you've drawn it or not, deactivate it, and thereby allowing yourself to enter short circuit focus only with the elements that you, you're you sure or you're trying to understand the, the mechanics to get the, the analysis done that you're trying to achieve. Uh, and, and so that's, that's kind of what I'm using in this technique as I kind of go about this demonstration. Secondly, I want to point out that Easy Power allows you to put only one tiebreaker on a bus, and so consequently, when I do a, a cross connect like this, and let's say for whatever reason I want to put on three utility, uh, let's start over. Easy Power allows me to only put one power source, isolated power source, on my one line. So if I were to go in and isolate or deactivate this particular tiebreaker and try to go to short circuit, I'd get an error that says we have isolated power systems um, and they've highlighted on the one line. So if they show me an, an error, what they my error list includes all the devices on that second utility. And so it's saying, okay, you can't do this with two different power sources. So what I've done... <clears throat> is built in a tiebreaker. Whether or not it's there or not is, is less important than the fact that I'm going to put it on the one line and then I'm going to leave it open. And at that point, Easy Power is able to kind of comprehend the fact that we have multiple utility sources or power sources and that are virtually connected together. And so now when I go to short circuit focus, it's able to deal with the fact that we have power coming in from but something that's referred to as a utility, and it's not necessarily isolated. Finally, I've done the same thing over here, and you see, you can see I've uh, deactivated the whole system. If I open this up <clears throat> and activate it back in my database editor, 
um, I'm actually applying a second tiebreaker to this center bus, the center main bus. If I go in and try to put it on there and then connect it to the other bus, oh, it's not going to let me do it, it realizes that there's a, that it, in fact, is a tiebreaker, and it allows, only allows one tiebreaker per bus structure. So what I've done is add, and again, this case, it's, it's a virtual connection, but I've put in a very short busway with a high capacity. So I, if I do close this breaker, I have no resistance to the connection, but that allows me now to interconnect multiple buses with, with tiebreakers. So in this case, I'm not going to be looking at this, so I'm going to deactivate this whole side. And let's go back to the topic in hand. What I've done is start off one side of my diagram with an infinite source. And by this, we're talking about 100,000 MVA capacity, 150 X over R utility. And I've set up a second one with more realistic numbers as far as what we would get from a utility company of 15,000 amps short circuit with an X over R capacity of 8.5 and then a overload or short circuit to ground 18,000 with a 9 X over R. And I don't want to connect them. I just want to compare what's happening in the two legs. All right. Likewise, I'm putting a... Uh, a fuse in the secondary side that my first pass I want to deactivate and I want to look at what would happen if I have the same primary uh, fuse. And so the point that I'm looking at and ultimately where I'm going with this is that initially you would think that the infinite source with the higher current capability would yield the worst result and the worst case scenario. But as I go to short circuit focus, you can see that, and I fault all the buses, that my current level, and we're showing this the symmetrical current for each of these buses, is 12,034 here, which is higher, versus 11,098 uh, amps on the realistic bus. Okay, so as we expected, the current available is higher, but when we go to calculate arc flash incident energy, now we see that the realistic bus is actually the higher uh, incident energy density, and that's by virtue of the fact that with the higher current, this device will trip quicker than it will with the lower current. And so I favor these types of examples because they're somewhat counterintuitive, and so quite Literally, the worst case scenario here is the more realistic uh, current from the utility. So infinite, and my point being is that the infinite source really didn't give me the worst case that I was looking for. All right, let's kind of look at, and so part of this example was I utilized the primary current protective device as my only uh, element in the system for limiting the arc. So let's go in and activate this secondary bus fuse and uh, see how that Im impact and get rid of the, the one at the primary and see if that changes anything. So still I have the infinite source from the utility on this left side. On the right side, the more realistic uh, numbers from the utility. Let's go ahead and look at the current. Again, we expect higher current from the infinite source, which we're seeing. And so in, in, now that I have, I've learned my lesson, I'd still expect this realistic incident energy calculation to be a little bit higher. And it is, even when we use the same protective device. OK, so, um, so that's, that's what I mean by the infinite utility is not as bad as it sounds and in no way does it really give us a worst case scenario. So now the question we're going to go to, let me just let's kind of back out of this and go back to the slides. So the question is how do we get the data that we need from the utility company? 
and it's surprising how frequently this comes up in terms of people starting with their first one-line diagram. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that and at the same time offer some alternatives if for some reason the utility company can't provide the data as requested. Now, in their defense, it may be that they don't have the uh, information or the parameters that we're asking for. Frequently, that can be the case in remote uh, co-ops, for instance, like we have in Oregon. In the remote areas, the, uh, there's co-ops that deliver the power from the grid to the local community, and they may not have details or the analysis of the uh, available short circuit current. Uh, on some, in some cases, the, they may not necessarily want to share what that utility data is. And in even other cases, there may be a misunderstanding of what's being requested or attempted. We suggest, in fact, we have forms that we suggest using when you're requesting information so that the company understands the need for conducting an arc flash and, and regulatory compliance. And part of that is should benefit them in terms of uh, making their community more safe. And again, that's going to be in the resource material I'm going to show at the tail end of this. So as you can see, uh, just from that example uh, that I started with as far as the modeling, utility source impedance, and, and in some cases more so, the impedance itself can have a bigger influence on the fault duty of my system and the effectiveness of my protective devices than even the short circuit current in total. And this is especially critical when we have, we don't have the buffer that our incoming transformer could provide. Specifically, if we have a one-to-one -one or we have incoming utility voltage at 480 and we're trying to use that voltage for our distribution system, then there's really no buffering as, as far as the energy. So the impedance that we're seeing from the utility company has a significant impact on what our uh, X over R environment is within the plant and consequently can give us problems with asymmetrical current if there is a fault. So a couple words about the data request. Again, what you should ask for is uh, some feedback that includes the real and imaginary components of the positive and the zero sequence neck uh, sequence networks and this goes to uh, again more of the the fact that there's going to be a reactive component in both the supply that you're receiving from the company but also in the reactive network that you're presenting as the load which is your plant so if you don't ask for those elements and explain that that's what you're looking for you may only get back a source impedance or the current magnitude and then sometimes communications quit because they feel the request has been fulfilled. If you're lucky, most will furnish short circuit data in the form of R plus JX, uh, the MV or the current level, short circuit current level that's provided at the point of common coupling. Seldom will they separate the real and reactive components, which includes the uh, zero sequence. And so a slight reduction of the resistance is one way to be conservative when you receive data that's not quite up to the needs of the, the modeling task. So now if you only get the magnitude of the short circuit current, there are ways to estimate based upon your location with respect to the uh, substation or the generation station and how far away you are. And uh, again, this is an excerpt from this material I'll be supplying at the end of this presentation. But in effect, if you're at the end of a remote run of specifically elevated line, your X over R ratio could be somewhere in the range of 3 to 8, whereas if you're right near the dam or the generator station, your X over R ratio could be somewhere higher than 20. And if you were near the step-down substation, you're probably somewhere in the middle of that range frequently we'll guesstimate in the, the 10 to 12 or 10 to 15 range if you're close to the, sub, the uh, substation itself. Likewise, if you, have, uh, if you have an understanding or an awareness of what breaker ratings are being used by the utility in their interrupt 
station or disconnect station for the utility itself, these are estimates of what the per unit impedance is based on the uh, MVA per MVA or 10 MVA. And so if you can get the utility voltage and you can figure out or, or get some kind of feedback on what type of breaker, interrupt rating on the breaker that's being used, then you can use this ratio for the per unit impedance per 10 MVA. Now, if you're at the end of a long transmission line run, again, this goes back to the, the distance from, from the generator, or if you have a, a significant, especially in a remote area, a significant length of elevated transmission lines before you get to the substation, before you get to your point of coupling or transformer, these are, are relative uh, values for short circuit current in kiloamps. If your uh, substation MVA is in the 10 to 60 range, then based upon the distance you are from the uh, substation, these are the X over R ratios that you, you could utilize as estimates, where these are actually measured for these particular parameters. So what we have here are the the large conductor, the medium conductor, and the small conductor size, the size of the substation itself, and then the distance in miles. And then this particular grid shows me the X over R estimates that we would have been measured for these conditions. And again, if you just look at the, the variations, you can be right next to the substation and have a 4.9 X over R or five miles away from it, see an X over R as low as 1.7, even with uh, large cable connections between you and the and the substation. Now, so these these numbers can be utilized to work out an estimated short circuit current, um, available short circuit current, given the distance you are and the size of the connecting cables and transmission lines. Now, what I'd like to suggest is that all, this, all of this information is in two uh, available from Easy Power in the form of two manuals. One is a recently updated book, which very correctly can be considered the source book of all the information and the, the way that the Easy Power tools work in the background. The name of the document is Practical Solution Guide to Art Flash Hazards, and it's available on easypower.com on the uh, Art Flash resources page if you uh, and it's big enough that you have to download it from a website you can't email it if you can't find it by all means shoot me an email or uh, contact sales at easypower.com and say hey where do I find that book Jim was talking about the practical solutions guide to arc flash and then the second uh, reference is the notes from the arc flash data collection class that we teach and it's a document called Data Collection for Art Flash Study. It's not available for download, but if you contact sales at easypower.com, they should be able to email it to you. And again, it goes into, it's where these charts are taken from. And I encourage you to review it as an Easy Power tool owner. If you've got questions on how to interpolate your particular situation, by all means, contact tech support at easypower.com, and uh, they will help you triangulate a good, a good case for determining what's a best case and a worst case, and then be able to bracket your, your situation most accurately in terms of being able to give you a conservative result on uh, your study. Okay, so what have we learned? Well, it's, first of all, it's important to get the utility data correct. And it's best to work, if, if at all possible, with the utility company to get the most accurate data. If you do not get acceptable information or information that you can rely on from the utility company, it's possible to use the assumptions and make sure that you document the details of what those assumptions are. And anytime you start working with assumptions, you want to make sure that you work out a, a best case and a worst case. And, and as we noticed in the first example, the infinite source is not the worst case. Frequently, people will utilize a 50% current level from whatever they're given from the utility company and factor that into their study to verify 
that if for some reason there's a limit in available short circuit current from the utility company at a time when they have a fault, how does that adversely affect their study results and is there a potential for increased danger uh, if that kind of condition has a potential you know, for a future event? But that's probably all I want to cover for today. I would encourage you to visit the easypower.com website frequently. Uh, there you'll find demo versions of the tools available, many, over th three dozen now, recorded tutorials not only on how to use EasyPower, but advanced topics including coordination, power flow, dynamic stability, and harmonics. We have a regional training uh, this year scheduled. I believe there's six regional trainings every other month. Later this year we'll be in Toronto.